Okay, so let's talk about applications involving exponential and logarithmic functions. Let's take a look at this first one. It says the formula p equals 14.7 times e to the negative 0.21x gives the atmospheric pressure p in pounds per square inch at an altitude x in miles above sea level. They would like us to find the average atmospheric pressure of a city that is one mile above sea level. So, we read the problem through once to get an idea of what's going on, and now it's time to take it apart and see what they have. So, when we read up until the first punctuation mark, which is this comma here, we notice that they give us a formula. So, our formula is P equals 14.7 times E to the negative 0.21x. They tell us P is the atmospheric pressure, right, and the unit they give is in pounds per square inch. So that's how you write pounds per square inch in abbreviation notation. They also tell us x. x is the altitude. And they say the altitude is in miles. But it's miles above sea level. Got it? Okay. Now, here's the question. They say find the average atmospheric pressure. So, in other words, they want us to find P of a city that is one mile above sea level. Well, that one mile above sea level is an altitude, isn't it? And the altitude is miles above sea level. So, in this particular case, we know that X equals 1 and where to find P. So, our formula will now look like P equals 14.7 times E to the negative 0.21 times 1. Agreed? Okay, so now it's time for some calculator work. Now here's the deal. I'm going to walk you through how I'm going to do it. And then, and some of you may do it a little differently and you'll get the same answer. Me personally, I like to do things in stages on my graphing calculator because if I miss a parenthesis, I could miss the entire answer. So first thing I'm going to do is I am going to multiply the two exponents together, which is clearly negative 0.21. That's the first thing I'm going to do. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to figure out e to that power. Got it? So we have to hit second function ln, don't we? It opens a parenthesis. Make sure you hit the negative key that is next to the enter key. And then the 0.21. And close your parenthesis, and I would hit equals. So just so we're on the same page, I got approximately 0.81. And then, last but not least, I would take this, and I would multiply by the 14.7. This would be the third thing that I do. All right? So let me mark this as number two. So the third thing that I do is now multiply this times 14.7. And hopefully you and I will get the same answer. So, and what do they say? They say round to the nearest tenths place. So the atmospheric pressure I have is 11.9 pounds per inches squared or square inch. Cool? Okay, let's look at the next problem. It says this formula, W equals 0 0.00188H, raised to the power of 2.67 is used to estimate the normal weight, W, of a boy that is H inches tall. So they ask us to find the expected height of a boy who is 85 pounds. So let's take a look. So again, first thing they tell us is the formula. And it's always a good idea to rewrite it. And then they tell us what the variable stands for. They say... Uh, that W is the normal weight of a boy. It didn't say a girl, it says a boy. So W is the weight of a boy, right? And H is how hot, how tall he is, right? So this is inches in height, agreed? 
and they want us to find the expected height of a boy who is 85 pounds. All right, so here's the deal. They have told us that the weight is 85 pounds, and they would like us to find the height, right? Okay, so our formula is looking like 85 equals 0 0.00188H to the 2.67 power. Agree? Okay, so first things first. We need to solve for H. We need to get H by itself. So what do you think the first thing we have to do? Good, we have to get rid of this particular decimal. So, I don't know about you, but, you know, that looks like a division on both sides to me. So, it looks like we have 85 divided by 0 0.00188 is equal to H raised to the 2.67. Agreed? Now, I still need to get H by itself, which means I need to get rid of that power. Now, I know this sounds rather odd because you're like a 2.67 power. Well, that's true. Now, remember, what's the inverse of a power? What cancels a power? Yeah, a root. A root is the inverse of a power, which means we're going to have to take the 2.67 root on both sides. And I know that sounds really odd because you're like, really? But that's the power to get rid of, and I have to do a root to do it. Now, again, let's talk about the calculator. Okay, so now we have to take the 2.67 root of that wonderful little fraction. Now, here's how we can do it. We need to find the nth root button, and that's under math. And you see that number five? Okay, don't hit it yet. See the little X in front of the root? So, and by the way, if you're like, what are you talking about? Let me kind of just write it here. You're looking for this little symbol under the math part. So this tells me, that little X tells me that I need to hit the 2.67 first. So we're going to hit 2.67 and then go to math and then scroll down to that number 5 where you see this symbol. And then when you scroll down to that number 5 and you hit enter, now it opens up the little root. Now, please put the parenthesis in and then you'll do 85 divided by 0.00. .00 one, eight, eight, and then close the parenthesis. That way it knows that you're taking the root of that entire fraction. And when you hit equals, let's see, they want you to round to the nearest tenth. I have the height is approximately 55.4 inches. Cool? Okay, let's go for another one. The size of a wolf population in a national park increases according to that formula. T is in time, and that's in years. This symbol is read Y sub zero, and it's the initial population at time zero. If the size of the current population is 73 wolves, find how many wolves there will be in eight years. So... Let's check it out. Clearly, they give us this formula, right? And they're telling me that the current population is 73 wolves. So, whoops, sorry, I put an extra equal to sign in there when I meant to put a multiplication symbol. So, the current population is 73 wolves. They want to know how many wolves there will be in eight years. So our time is equal to eight years, isn't it? And they want to know the ending population, basically, don't they? Right? Okay. So they tell us y sub zero is the initial population. Well, our initial population in this case is those 73 wolves. How do I know that? Because they want to wolves there are in eight years, which means we're starting with 73 wolves right now. So my formula is going to look like y equals 73 
times e to the 0 0.038 times, good, t, which in our case is 8, isn't it? Okay, so just like before, my recommendation is this. I would first figure out what this equals, right? So 0 0.038 times 8, I got 0 0.304. And then my second thing I would do is I would figure out e to that power. Okay, so I have to hit second function, ln, and then I'm going to hit second function, the negative key, so it takes it of the answer. And I got about 1.355. And then last but not least, I am now going to multiply by 73. Now, some of you can punch this all into your calculator in one shot. That's fine, be my guess. Just be careful of the parentheses. Now, they say round to the nearest whole number. Yeah, we don't have partial wolves. So, in eight years, we're going to have 99 wolves, according to my calculations. Good? Okay. Let's go for another one. We have the Richter scale. And if you're like, what's the Richter scale? Well, living in California, occasionally an earthquake pops up. And the Richter scale measures the magnitude of the earthquake, as it says in the first line. So the formula for the magnitude R, so the magnitude is represented by R, of an earthquake is given by that formula. A is the amplitude in micrometers of the vertical motion of the ground. So in other words, how high is the ground going, right? How high is the ground lifting up? At the recording station... Pardon me. Vertical motion of the ground at the recording station. T is the number of seconds between those su successive seismic waves. B is an adjustment factor that takes into account the weakening of the seismic wave as the distance increases from the epicenter of the earthquake. So they would like us to use this formula to find the magnitude. So we're looking for R of the earthquake given that the amplitude is 50 micrometers. The time between waves is 1.3 seconds and B is 1.5. So, it basically gave us all the information we need, right? They said find R and they told us the amplitude. They said the amplitude, amplitude is 50 micrometers. Well, A is that amplitude, right? Divided by T, T is the number of seconds between six seismic waves. And they said the time between waves is 1.3 seconds. And then they said B, they just flatly told us B was 1.5. So, this log, do you see a base here? When you don't see it, what is it? Good, that's a base 10. So, I'm going to find the log button on my calculator. It opens up the parentheses. I'm going to do 50 divided by 1.3. I'm going to close it. And me personally, I'll hit the equal to sign. So I got about 1.585. And then I'm going to add to it that 1.5 that they gave us at the end. And let's see. They say round to the nearest tenth. So we have, or I've got at least, my Richter scale is about a 3.1 magnitude earthquake. With all this information, we got a 3.1 earthquake. Good? Okay, so let's check out some more information. They want us to use this formula to solve the following compound interest form interest problem. Now, before I go any further, let's look at the formula and let's identify some variables. A, that's the ending balance in an account. is the beginning balance. Let's see, R is the interest rate, and rate is a percentage. T is time, and by the way, in the finance industry, time is in years, always in years. So if they put it in months, you've got to convert it to years. And last but not least, N. N is the number of times per year the account is being 
compounded. N is the number of times per year the account is being compounded. So, if it was compounded daily, that would be 365, wouldn't it? If it was compounded quarterly, that would be four times a year, wouldn't it? If it's compounded semi-annually, that's twice a year, isn't it? Okay, so let's take a look at some of this information they gave us. They're telling us, or they're asking how long, right? So that means you're looking for, yeah, you're looking for T. Does it take for $1,700 to double if it is invested at 3% compounded monthly? So we're looking for T, aren't we? All right. So $1,700, what does $1,700 represent? Yeah, that's your initial amount. How do I know? Because they're trying to double it. So if they're trying to double it, my ending balance should be $3,400, shouldn't it? 3% is the rate, but you never write it as a percentage. You always write it as a decimal. And the end is compounded monthly. So how many times a year is that? Good, that's 12. So let's see what this formula looks like. I have got 3,400 equal to 1,700. And in the parentheses, 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12. And that's raised to the, I'm looking for T, and 12T. Good? Okay. First thing I would do is I would divide by the 1,700 on both sides. So I would get 2 equals. And by the way, while I'm thinking about it, let's compute inside the parentheses. So we've got 0 0.03 divided by 12, right? And then you've got to add 1 to it. So I've got 1.0025 raised to the 12T. Are we good? Okay, now, here's my challenge. I have got T in the exponent, don't I? I have got the T in the power position, which is not where I want my variable to be. I need it on the ground, so I need to knock out this base, don't I? Okay, remember a previous lecture. To knock out the base of an exponential function, you need to take the, that's right, you need to take the log function of the same base. So I'm going to take log of 1.0025 on both sides. Log of 1.0025 on both sides. Let me fill this in a little bit so you can see it. So notice what's going to happen. Yeah, log base 1.0025 and exponential of the same base, these guys are going to knock out, aren't they? Which will leave us log of 1.0025 base of 2 is equal to 12t. And then I have to divide both sides by 12, don't I? Okay, so... The base is 1.0025, isn't it? Okay, looks like you're going to have to use the change of base formula. So I'm going to let you remember how to do that because we did do that in a previous lecture. So I'm going to take the log of 2, close my parentheses, equal. I'm going to divide it by the log of 1.0025, close my parentheses, equals. And then I'm going to divide by 12. So what do they say? Round to the nearest tenth. I've got this doubling process happening in 23.1 years. Yeah, I don't know if that's such a good idea to invest my money in that account. So the decision is yours. Got it? Okay, let's check out another finance one. By the way, this formula right here isn't just used for you putting your money into a savings account. They also use it to compute loans. Remember that. Okay, let's look at this one. 
How much money does Barbara Mack owe at the end of seven years if 5% interest is compounded continuously on an $1,800 debt? Now, when they say compounded continuously, now this is the formula I use. On the previous problem, they said compounded monthly. If they say monthly or daily or annually, if they say anything but continuously, I'm going to use this formula. But if they say compound continuously, this is the compound continuous formula. So remember that. Notice some of the variables are the same as the other one. I have A, which is the ending balance still. I have B, which is my beginning balance. I have R, which is the rate, which is always the percentage, and T, which is the time, which is always the years. Good? Okay. So let's check it out. Let's see what information they've given us. They want to know how much does she owe at the end of seven years. So I know the time is seven years. And they tell us the rate is 5%. Right? It's compounded continuously, which means you use this formula, and the debt is $1,800. So that sounds like the beginning balance to me. And we've got to find how much she owes at the end of that seven years, right? Okay. So let's fill in the blank. A equals 1,800 times E raised to the, that's right, 7.05. Okay, so you start doing your calculator punching. I'll do my calculator punching, and we'll see if we get the same thing. How you doing? You finding that E button? I hope so. Okay, I'm almost done. Hopefully you are too. All right, now, to be honest with you, they shouldn't tell us how many decimal places to round. Why? Because it's money. But one of the things they did say was round to the nearest cent. They didn't say dollar. They said the nearest cent. Why? Because, you know, the banks want to the nearest penny. They want their pennies as well as their dollars. So I have $2,554.32. That's how much she's going to owe at the end of seven years. So she has to pay about $750 in interest, doesn't she? Well, she has to decide if it's worth it. And so do you if you ever have to take out a loan. Okay, here's another one. How much money does Dana Jones have after nine years if she invests $1,600 at 7% 7 interest compounded continuously? There's that word continuously again, which tells me to use this formula. Okay, so the tables are reversed. She's putting this money into an account, into a savings account, and we're going to find out how much money she has at the end of nine years. So let's see if you follow along. So nine years is my time, right? $1,600 would be my beginning balance. 7% is my rate. And we need to fit, find A, don't we? So let's see. This is what I'm seeing the setup is. Hopefully, we're in agreement. Good? Okay. Time to get those calculators out again, right? So, hopefully you have found the E button once again. And got it. Almost there. Okay. So, again, clearly round to the nearest cent, which should tell you already how many decimal places. Because you want your pennies as well, right? So, I have that she will have $3,004 and 18 cents at the end of the nine years. So she has to decide if it's worth it to leave it in there nine years to earn what? Another $1,400? Maybe. All right, now let's take a look at this particular slide. We're gonna be dealing with some exponential and growth and decay models, all right? Notice this formula. This formula is like this continuous compounding formula. It's exactly the same formula. They just change the variables around. And why do they use continuous compounding? Well, 
if they're talking about populations, populations continuously grow and they continuously decay, don't they? Right? Something dies, it, can, it decays on a regular basis. A baby gets born, a baby grows on a continuous basis, right? So, anyway. So, the ending population is P, which is our ending balance, right, from the previous formula. P sub zero is the beginning population. Well, that's like the beginning amount of money, right? T is time. Now, here's the cool thing. Time in this case could be in any time unit. Years, weeks, months, days, hours, minutes, seconds, etc. Okay, time does not have to be in years. Only in the finance industry do you need time in years. And K is the rate. How fast is it growing? How fast is it decaying? So notice, if K is greater than zero, then it's a growth model. If K is less than zero, then it's a decay model. Got it? Okay. So notice this little note. If you are not given an equation, then the two pieces of information that you need to write, then the two pieces of information you need to write one are the beginning population and the rate. I'll read that again. If you are not given the equation, then the two pieces of information you need to write, then the two pieces of information you need to write one are the beginning population and the rate. So let's take a look at this one. C to the 14th. It's a form of carbon that is used to find the age of fossils. So any of you aspiring archaeologists out there, you're going to want to know the carbon-14 content. That's what this stands for, carbon-14. So they tell you that carbon-14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. They want to know how much of a 30-gram sample is left after 11,000 years. All right, so here's something you need to understand about half-life. Half-life tells you that however much carbon-14 you've got in 5,730 years, 50% of the original amount decayed. 50% of the original amount is gone. And it takes a lot longer for the other 50% to decay. So here's the deal. This is a decay model because half-life tells you things are decaying. So the formula that you need is the one we just went over. But they didn't give us an equation, did they? So we're writing the generic equation, and we need to come up with the specific equation. Are you with me? We need the specific equation. They didn't give it to us. Need specific equation. And remember the note. The two pieces of information you need to write one are the beginning population and the rate. So that means I need P sub zero and I need R. So the question is, do I have either one of them? Yes, I do. I know that we have 30 grams. So that much I know, but I don't see anything about the rate. Do you? Okay, so. Looks like we need to find the rate. So to find the rate, let's look. I know P sub zero is 30 grams. Got it. I'm looking for the rate, which means I'm looking for K. That's the only variable that needs to be in this problem, which means I need to know the ending and I need to know the time. Do I know the ending balance? Do I know the time? Some of you may be saying, hey, I know the time. It's 5,730 years. That's true. That is the time. But that's the half-life time. What does half-life mean? 50% of it has decayed, which means your ending is 15 grams. Got it? Your ending is 15 grams. So if the ending is 15 grams, now... I filled in the last piece of information I need to find the rate. Let's divide by 30. 15 divided by 30 is a half, isn't it? Which makes sense because it was half-life. 
All right. K is what I'm trying to solve for, and it's in the power position. Lovely. So that means I need to put it on the ground. Are you with me? So what are you going to have to do to put it on the ground? That's right. You're going to have to take the log base C on both sides, aren't you? You're going to have to take the log base E on both sides in order to cancel the base E exponent. So log base E, canceling base E on the exponential. By the way, what's log base E? That's right. That's ln, isn't it? Okay, so let me switch gears a little bit. So that's ln of 0 0.5 equaling 5,730 times k. And last but not least, you need the ln of 0 0.5 divided by 5,730 is equal to k. There is my rate. But look at this direction here. Do not round until the final answer. What does that mean? Don't put the K as a decimal. Leave it alone. Do not put the K as a decimal. Leave it alone. So you have found your specific equation. Remember, you need the beginning, which was 30 grams. E times the rate, which was, in our case, ln of 0 0.5 over 5,730 times T. And now I am able to answer their question. And their question was, how much is left after 11,000 years? So I am going to plug in that 11,000 for my time. Okay, time to get our calculators out, isn't it? So, I don't know about you, but me personally, I'm going to figure out this power stuff. I want to know what number this is. So, I'm going to take the natural log of 0 0.5. And I'm going to hit equals. And then I'm going to take that answer, and I'm going to divide it by the 5,730 and get that answer. And then I'm going to multiply it by 11,000. Equals. So I've got a negative number in my calculator, negative 1.33 approximately, which makes sense, right? Because this is a decay model. So that number in the exponent should be negative. That means things are going down. Okay. And then I need to take E, and I need to raise it to that answer. And now I've got a positive 2.6 approximately, and then I'm going to multiply it by that 30. And let's see, they say round to the nearest tenth. So I have got approximately 7.9 grams left after 11,000 years. Which makes sense, because we knew after 5,730 years, only 15 grams would be left. This is 11,000 years, so my answer is less than the 15 grams, which makes perfect sense. I should have had less than 15 grams left, considering 11,000 was larger than the 5,730 years, which was the half-life. Cool? Okay, let's go for another one. An isotope has a half-life of 108 years. How much of a 23-gram sample is left after 200 years? Boy, that problem sounds familiar, doesn't it? We got half-life again, don't we? And in this case, half-life is 108 years, isn't it? So this is another decay model, isn't it? But did they give me the equation? Of course not. So we have a generic equation. And the generic equation looks like P equals P sub 0, E to the KT, right? And what are the two pieces of the puzzle we need to know? We need the initial amount and we need the K. So, did they give us the initial amount? 
Yeah, right here. They give us 23 grams. Did they give us the K? Of course not. That would be too easy, wouldn't it? So, find K to write the specific equation. So, we have 23 of the initial amount, e to the K. So, K is the only thing that should be unknown, right? So that means I need to know the time. They told me the time, 108 years. And that's the half-life, which means, that's right, half of 23, which is, that's right, 11.5. And now I get to solve for K, which means what do we do? Yeah, divide both sides by the 23. Agreed? So I don't know about you, but when I did that on my calculator, I got a half. E to the 108K. Good. Okay. And now I've got to take the LN on both sides because LN is going to cancel that base E. So bye bye there. Which means K is going to be equal to LN, the so 0.5 divided by 108. Good? Okay, so you have your two pieces of the puzzle now. You have the initial amount and now you have K. So your specific equation for this problem looks like P equals 23 times E. My K is this lovely little fraction, right? Times T. All right, now we can answer their question. How much of a 23 gram sample is left after 200 years? So my time is 200. So now P equals 23 E raised to the power of LN of 0 0.5 divided by 108 times those 200 years. Okay, time for calculator work. Agreed? So again, I'm going to figure out what this number is going to be, what that power is going to be. So I'm going to take that ln of 0.5 equals, and then I'm going to divide it by 108 equals, and then I'm going to multiply it by 200 equals. And I've got a negative number. I've got approximately negative 1.28. And now I'm going to take that, and I am going to find e raised to that answer. And let's see, I got a positive 0.277. Hopefully you got the same. And then we get to multiply it by 23. So let's see, they said round to the nearest tenth. So we have P is approximately 6.4 grams. Cool? Okay. Let's keep going. A rare isotope of nuclear materi material is very unstable. It decays at a rate of 11% for each second. Find how much isotope remains 14 seconds after 6 grams of the isotope is created. Okay, I'm seeing another decay model. But what I don't see is my specific formula. Wasn't that nice of them? Okay, so let's see what we got. The generic formula, let's get this down. The generic formula is P equals P sub zero E to the KT. I need to know P sub zero and I need to know the rate. So let's look. Did they give me the initial amount? Yeah, they did. Six grams. Right? Find how much isotope remains 14 seconds after 6 grams is actually created. So my initial amount is 6 grams. Did they give me the rate? They did! Wasn't that nice of them. The rate's 11%. Okay, so I can actually write a specific formula now. Yay! This was not as much work as the last two problems. So my specific equation looks like P equals 6. Times e to 
to the point 11 T. All right, so I need to know how much is left after 14 seconds. And gratefully, this was 11% each second. So everything is in the same units. E.11 times 14. Okay, you get your calculator. I get my calculator. We'll, oh, wait a minute. I forgot something, didn't I? Do you know what I forgot? Hmm. Some of you may have caught it. Some of you may not have. It said decay, didn't it? So should my rate be positive? Nope, it should be negative. That should be a negative. That should be a negative. Ah. So, I am going to figure out my print, my power first. I have a negative 0.11 times 14, which means a negative 1.54 is what I have. We're going to take e to that power, right? And then we're going to multiply it by 6. And I don't know about you, but I ended up with P being approximately, what, how many places do they want? One place. 1.3 grams. They said nearest tenth. How are we doing? Does this make sense? Okay. Let's see about another one. All right. So, we have a National Park Service. National Park Service personnel are trying to increase the size of the bison population of a natural national park. 211 bison currently live in the park. If the population's rate of growth is 2% annually, how many bison should there be in seven years? Okay, again, they didn't give me a formula. Wasn't that nice of them? But they did say it's a growth formula, just like the previous ones are telling me DK. Gratefully, the formula does not change. So my generic equation is still P equals P sub 0 times A to the K T. I need to know P sub 0 and I need to know K. Did they give me the initial amount? Yeah, they told me 211 bison live in the park. And they told me the growth rate was 2%. Good. So, because they told me those two pieces of information, I can now write the specific equation. The specific equation is P equals 211 E to the 0 0.02 times T. What do they want to know? How many bison are there in seven years? Guess I found my time. So, in seven years, right? P will be equal to 211 times E to the 0 0.02 times 7. Okay. Looks like we have calculator work again, right? So, you do your work. I'll do my work. Hopefully, you found that E button again. And I have in seven years, and notice they want you to round to the nearest whole number. There's no partial bisons. I have that the population will be approximately 243 bison in seven years. Cool? How are we doing? These problems are basically the same, except when they decay, you're going to have a negative rate. And when it's growth, you're going to have a positive rate. Agreed? Okay, so let me go back, and we are looking at this particular problem. The number of employees for a certain company has been decreasing by 7% each year. If the company currently has 670 employees and this rate continues, how many employees are they going to have 12 years? Okay, we're decreasing. You know what's going on, right? Okay. So... Generic equation, because they didn't give me anything. P equals P sub 0, E to the KT. We need P sub 0, we need K. Did they give me either one? Yes, they did. The company currently has 670 employees, and it's decreasing at 7%, and it's a negative 
7%, isn't it? So that tells me the specific equation is going to be P equals 670 times E to the negative 0 0.07 times T. And now they're going, well, what happens in 12 years? So let's see. In 12 years, we've got P equals 670 E to the negative 0.7 times 12. Exactly. Hopefully you're getting the hang of this because it's almost sounding like the same thing keeps happening or the same type of problem keeps happening. It's just changing from bison to people to grams of isotope or whatever, right? Okay, so you work on this problem. I'll work on this problem. Hopefully, again, you found the uh, E button. And let's see, round to the nearest whole number because there's no partial employees. So I have approximately 289 employees will be left after 12 years. Cool? All right, one more. Let's see what's going on with this one. Suppose a city with a population of 900,000 has been growing at a rate of 7% per year. If this rate continues, what will the population be in 18 years? Okay, see if you follow along. I don't see a generic, I don't see an equation, so I'm writing the generic equation out. I know I need the initial amount, which is 900. 7% and it's growing. So this is positive. Yay! My specific equation then is going to be P equals 900,000 people times E to the point zero seven t And so now in 18 years. This is what I need to compute. So I'm hoping you've got your calculator still out, which I'm sure you do. And you work on it. I'll work on it. And hopefully we get the same number. Again, hopefully you found your E button. Okay, I'm going to write it over here. So I have the population, and they say round to the nearest whole number, will be approximately 3,172,864. So, 3, people. That's a lot of people in 18 years. Okay, so hopefully this made some sense to you. Please go back and re-listen to this because, especially when you're trying to find the specific equation, sometimes they give you the rate, sometimes they don't, and when you need to find the rate, you need to find the other pieces to the puzzle to help you find it. Cool? So have fun with this stuff, and I'll catch you on the flip side.